every family has a legacy. And the legacy is not just stuff you leave them. <coughs> Excuse me. Not the stuff you leave them. It's who you are and what you pass on to your children and your grandchildren. The kind of person that you are. One of the things that I've done with my grandchildren, especially the ones that live nearby, is they'll do something peculiar, offbeat. They'll make a face or they'll do something that's just strange. And I'll say to them, you know, you are really weird. And the proper response to that is, thank you very much, I'm a Merrill. Or, as the case may be, I have three grandchildren who are more weird than the Merrills. Moors. See, when I have to explain a dad joke, it's like really pitiful. Isn't that really pitiful? It's bad. Anyway, so the Canadian children are down with Tim. Kirsten is working night. She's got a new job as a nurse. She's a charge nurse and has to stay up all night, sleep during the day. So he brought the six kids, which we, I, Pam saw them in February break. I haven't seen them in a year, and everybody else hasn't seen them in two years. So they're down here, and I said something to Jacob about being weird. And Jacob said, thank you very much. And the others looked at me like, what? So I taught all the Canadians, if someone calls you weird, the proper response is, thank you very much, I'm a Merrill. So Eli took upon himself to quiz everybody. <laughs> Without their knowing, he walked up. Then he would report to me who failed the test. And ultimately, Ethan didn't want to pass the test. And Eli said, Ethan's the oldest one. Eli said to me, he's out of the family. I said, why? He said, because I asked him, are you weird? And he said, yes. That's not the right answer. It's thank you very much. And I said, well, that's kind of a weird answer, isn't it? He said, well, kind of. I said, so he's back in. He said, Judah, he also quizzed, Judah's only four, just turned four. Judah didn't answer. I said, he's only four. You don't get a legitimate answer until they're five. He goes, okay, I'm waiting until next year. Then I'm going to ask him. So I'm starting a short June series called Jesus is the Son, S-O-N. One of the questions that was asked this week from my African class, I have 67 grandchildren in Africa, and I teach them every Saturday for an hour. They ask questions about the Bible. In Kenyan schools, they have Bible class. It's a Christian organization, Christian environment in the public schools. They hire Bible teachers, but the Bible teachers are not really experts in the Bible. So the kids have tons of questions. And there's 42 of the kids in this orphanage. There are 67 total, but 42 of them are in the upper grades. So they're in my class. I'm their Sokoro, which is grandfather in Akagusi. And one of the questions they had today was in the book of Ezekiel, he calls himself the son of man. But Jesus is also the son of man. And how can Ezekiel be the son of man if Jesus is the son of man? Because the title should not be shared. I thought, well, that's really great. So as I thought, I got that question earlier this week on Tuesday. Did I do anything? There we go. So I'm going to do a four-part series through this month. The second one, if you have to miss any week, miss this week. But don't miss next week because it's really interesting. Of course, you see bumper stickers. My, uh, my... Messiah or my Savior is the son of a carpenter, a Jewish carpenter, whatever. You see that kind of stuff all over. And it's really interesting what the scripture actually does say about him being the son of a carpenter. Anyway, son of man is today, son of a carpenter, son of David is a very interesting expression used all the way through. We're going to stay in the Gospel of Matthew. And then he is the son of God is the fourth one for the last week of June. I had two passages to start today. Let's see if I can click to that. There we go. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 
he's having a series of dreams and visions, Daniel is, that he doesn't really exactly understand, but sometimes he has the interpretation, sometimes he doesn't. One of the things that's absolutely amazing about this Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, is never explained. He just says, I have a, I have a vision of a, of a stranger. And then he doesn't say what it means. Very interesting. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there was before me one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And Daniel doesn't explain that. And he doesn't ever bring it up again. It's just Wow, this one little brief snapshot, like a lightning bolt in the Old Testament, clearly describing the presence, the coming of Jesus without his name, but unmistakable. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 11. There are many places in Matthew that we could have turned. But I chose Matthew 11 Because it's so strange concerning the title, the Son of Man. I'm reading a little bit larger part of the passage so you have some context. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the various towns in in Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one that we are expecting to come or should we expect someone else? This is John the Baptist's cousin. Here's what Jesus is doing in terms of miraculous activity and also phenomenal teaching. And he asked him a direct question. Are you the one we're waiting for? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Well, if not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Well, what did you go to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you more than a prophet. This is the man about who it was written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. All the prophets and the law are prophesied until John, willing to accept it. He is the Elijah who is to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and dance. We sang a dirge, but you didn't mourn. 
For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Two different descriptions of the son of man. It's a title. It occurs frequently in the prophecy of Ezekiel. He is called the son of man over and over, 90 times in the book of Ezekiel. The title son of man is used, and it usually refers to Ezekiel as the prophet, as he speaks of himself. He says, God said to me, O son of man, But as Israel was waiting for their Messiah to come to deliver them, the concept of the Son of Man became a title for him. Here's what's interesting about that. When the kids asked today about Son of Man, they speak Ekagusi, a language I don't really know. I know a few words, but not very many. Ekagusi is the language of the Gusi tribe, which is Western Kenyan people. And in their language, it says, a son of a man. But that's not the title. So I have to teach them Hebrew through English so they can interpret it in Ekagusi and hopefully understand what God is saying in his word. Let me tell you, it's a trick. In Hebrew, the title is Ben Adam or Ben Adam. Adam is the name given to the first human male, but it does not mean a human male. Adam, in Hebrew, is mankind, the human being, all of us. And what's interesting is in Genesis, when it says God created Adam, he created Adam, male and female. Very, very interesting expression, missed by most people who read the Bible. Adam is all of us. And when Ezekiel says, there is a Savior coming, he is not to be called the son of Abraham or the son of Isaac or the son of Jacob, Israel. He is not the son of Judah. He's given a title, son of David, but that has a different meaning altogether. What's fascinating is he wasn't given a title that said he belongs to Jewish people. He's going to save Israel. He is going to come within our system and restore our nation back to its glory, take care of our enemies, and make us the most important people of the world again. He was called the son of man, the son of humankind, the son of Adam. Then Adam means he is the one who is the savior for everyone. When Ezekiel spoke, it's very interesting. If you read his prophecy, the book of Ezekiel, if you read it as if you are a Jew in exile, it has one meaning, very limited. There's all kinds of things in the book of Ezekiel that speak about future of promise and hopefulness and restoration. But if you read it instead as of humankind, that God is reaching into the world as a whole and he is speaking to every human heart, not just people within the law of Moses, not just within the traditions of Judaism, but everyone else everywhere is able to be redeemed and brought back into right relationship with God. That's what the Son of Man was to do, to restore Adam from the brokenness of the garden to the restoration of heaven. Very, very interesting. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, repeatedly Jesus takes on the title Son of man for himself. He refers to himself in third person, a very common tactic of presenting an idea. And Jesus says 
the son of man is the one who comes. And when he quotes, he quotes in the Old Testament, the son of man came eating and drinking and the mockers, the, the self-appointed aristocrats, the snobbish people who think they know everything, when they met the son of man, me, and they say, he eats and he drinks. He's not a prophet. Prophets gave that stuff up. They lived an alternative lifestyle. He's got friends. He goes to their house and he eats with them. These disgusting people who we call sinners. No righteous person would ever hang out with people like that. There's a place where Jesus says he is called a friend of sinners. And the phrase in Greek actually is better translated, he was called a friend by sinners. They called him their friend. Not the Pharisees and Sadducees. Not the people who thought they had it all nailed down. Or not the religious people. But the average ordinary person struggling to try and figure it out knew Jesus would come to dinner if they invited him. And he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't condemn them. He didn't come to the world to condemn the world. He came to heal, to restore. So when they see the Son of Man, they knew who John was, and Jesus even clearly says, he's Elijah. If you can take it, he's Elijah. He is coming to make the way for the Messiah. And the Messiah is the Son of Man, and he so much is a Savior for all of mankind he actually has friends who are sinners. And tax collectors, that was the bottom of society. That was, they were people that robbed from their own people to give to the Romans, and they robbed from the Romans to enrich themselves. They had no friends except other tax collectors, and everyone despised them. They were the bottom of society. So when Matthew says, the Son of Man hangs out with sinful people, and even tax collectors call him their friend. It was meant as an insult. To refer to him as the son of man, being a friend of sinners, was so disconnected. It was almost laughable, hilarious, that someone could ever say the son of man who redeems mankind, not just Jews, everyone, not only hangs out with these people, but he's bonded with them. He's connected to them. He is their friend. They are delighted with him. It was intended as an insult. And Jesus takes it as a form of pride. It's very, very interesting. It's kind of like calling him weird. And his response is, thank you very much. He took that on as an emblem, as an evidence of the entire shift of who the Messiah is from this grand, glorious, super powerful, top of everything individual to someone who comes in and he'd actually come to your house and he'd sit on your floor and he'd eat a meal with you and he'd drink with you. That is just absolutely astounding. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, 1 through 8, which is the next section, I'll close with this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath day. His disciples were hungry, ordinary folks, Saturday afternoon. They began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath day. How disgusting. Disgusting. You ought to be ashamed. You ought to stop them from doing that. That is just horrible. Jesus said, didn't you read where King David, what he did when he and his companions were hungry? He walked right into the house of God. And he and his companions took the consecrated bread right off the altar and ate it. That wasn't lawful for them to do, only priests. Or didn't you read in the law the priests on the Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, yet they're innocent. I tell you, someone greater than the temple is here. 
If you knew what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned innocent people. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Very, very interesting. They intended to mock him, to insult him, to control him, to put him down, and he kept taking a title that they all were waiting for the huge Savior and saying, do you know what it means? It means common folks have a chance. That it doesn't belong to just the insiders, it's for everyone. Jesus is the Son of Man. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you Our faith isn't perfect. Our doctrine isn't always exactly right. Things are changing as we grow and learn. It is not a thing or a system that we believe in. It is a person. And so we come to discover who you are, how you reveal yourself. Sometimes that's an explanation, and sometimes it's just a presence. It is not an experience that we seek. It's not a doctrinal statement that we live by. It is Jesus, the Son of Man. And we would see him. In his name we pray.